Welcome everyone, 138MMA here to break down another UFC Fight Night card. We have Cannoneer versus Strickland in the main event. This Fight Night card is going to be insane. Something else I want to mention, this fight card has three of my top five favorite fighters on it. Unfortunately, two of them are fighting each other, so that, that's kind of a bummer. But three of my top five favorite fighters on this card, I'll link my video telling you about them at the end of this. Um, I'll, I'll make it the end screen. But something I want to say is there's a lot of really good fights on this card, and I'm actually almost almost as, if not more, excited for this fight card than I was for UFC 282 just last weekend. This fight card is going to be insane. There's so many fun fights, so many really close fights, and I think you guys are going to really enjoy it. So before we get too carried away with all this rambling, let's just go ahead and jump right into it right after this. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, 138 MMA proudly brings to you the hottest picks in the world. Up here we have Sergey Morozov taking on Journey Newsome in the 135 pound bantamweight division. In this matchup, a couple of guys looking to get their get their uh, get their feet under them a little bit, start getting some wins together. We have Newsome coming in uh, two two and one that won no contest there in his last five fights. Three and two on the other side for Morozov. This one's an interesting fight for a couple of reasons, and one that I don't feel super super confident in in my pick. So I'm gonna profess it with that, but. For this matchup, we've got the range striker in Journey Newsome. I think he's going to be, he's going to have more success at range. Obviously, he's the range striker. Whereas we have more in close, kind of dirty boxing style um, of, of Morozov in this one on the feet. If he gets to the ground, we have one guy that's more likely to get it there. I would say Morozov is more likely to get the takedowns. But Newsome isn't, isn't a slouch on the ground either. Uh, he does have some decent grappling to his, uh, to his credit. In this matchup, though, I don't think that this one's gonna, I don't think this one's gonna wow anybody as like the fight of the night or anything. I think it's gonna go one of two ways. Newsom's able to keep it at range, use that range striking to get the win that way, or Morozov's gonna get in close, hit him with a few shots, maybe get the takedown and finish it that way. Or we, I mean, we can get a decision, not necessarily a finish, but you know what I mean. That's the way that the fight's gonna progress. For me, I think the more likely outcome is going to be the Morozov side. So I'm going to lean that way. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Let's go to the next fight. I feel a little bit more confident about a few of them coming up. Letting so let's the go fireworks go early in this flyweight matchup. We have Manel Kopp coming in 3-2 and two in his last five fights with a couple of really close decisions in there. Taking on David Dvorak. Now, Dvorak is 4-1 and one in his last five. He is coming off of a loss to Mateusz Nikolaou. Tough night out for anybody, so no shame there. I don't know how these two ended up as the second fight of the night, but it's sure going to get the fans going, I do believe. In this matchup, I'm going to go ahead and start with the cop side here. Uh, very high-level striker. I do think both guys are very high-level strikers, but cop is a very, very high-level striker. He does set up his strikes, so these aren't just... They're not just naked strikes coming out of nothing. He's putting the, He's getting these set up with other strikes or feints or, uh, you know, footwork or whatever. He's setting up his strikes one way or another, more often than not, a lot of times it's by building a pattern in his strikes, doing X, Y, and Z enough times that your that his opponent's going to say, oh, he's going to do X, Y, and Z again. But no, he puts a W in there. And next thing you know, you got hit in the face with a foot or, an, or, a, you know, or a fist or whatever. So he's mixing these, these um, <clears throat> he's mixing in his strikes really well and setting up everything. He is also lightning fast and very explosive. A lot of the fights I've seen with Cop, especially on his uh, pre-UFC fights, because he he looked like a world beater pre-UFC. In the UFC, we've seen glimpses of it, but it hasn't been as much as we as we did prior to. But, like, the guy will just fly with a flying knee without any setup, which is impressive. A lot of people, when you see him come in with a flying knee, you see him kind of come down and then go, or, like, do the double clutch where the one knee comes up and then the other. No. Cop just flies with that flying knee. I would do it in here, but, like... I'm not going to knock something over. This is a very fragile setup, all right? Um, but anyway, so the flying knee. So he'll come uh, just just launch that knee with no setup, comes out of nowhere, and it's fast. It is so stinking fast. So it's very impressive. So for Cobb, I do really like the striking out of him. It's probably some of the best striking in the flyweight division overall, anyway. And that's that's if you were just exclusively looking at striking, nothing else. So... <clears throat> Something that I'm going to point out here that's kind of, it's not exactly the, the, the right way to put this. I said he works well with the cage push, but he doesn't so much with the cage push. You saw that more in his fights pre-UFC, because we haven't seen a ton of the cage push work here in the UFC. 
But pre-UFC, he fought a lot in a ring rather than a cage. And he would push his opponents up against the cage and tee off on them while they're all tangled up in the ropes, right? So the problem, though, there's no ropes in the UFC. It's an octagon. It is a cage. So he, we haven't really seen that at him. So I don't know for sure that he's going to be able to do this in the octagon. We haven't really seen it as much or at all, really. Um, so that is something that concerns me is that that ability is gone now that there's no longer ropes there. But uh, if you go back and watch some of his stuff in like Ryzen and things like that, you see him working the ropes really well and making his opponents kind of get tangled up while he can just tee off on him. And he did that a lot. He's also, another, another thing I like to mention about Cop is he's kind of low volume, but only sometimes. Sometimes he's really high volume and just goes in for the kill. But other times you can get him kind of standing there looking. And that's some of those really close split decisions that he'll lose or whatever. That's kind of where I think those come from is when he just kind of takes time off. And I don't know if he's trying to conserve his gas tank. I don't know if he's trying to look for openings. Probably the latter of the two that I just said there. But something he's, he's causing him to take some time off in a round. And, uh, and, and I think that's what's caused him in some of his fights. So so anyway, that's that's Manel Cop there. Striking is top tier, though. Very, very good striking. On the other side, for Dvorak. Now, he's also a solid striker. More into the counters um, than, than just the aggressive uh, onslaught. He is aggressive, but he aggressively counters. Like, he'll walk you forward. He's got good forward pressure, as I mentioned next. He got, has good forward pressure, so he'll walk you down. But he's countering you rather than really... How do I put this? So he's leading the dance by walking forward, but he's making you throw and then hitting, hitting you. So he does very well with that. He also has a really nasty leg kick. I will say Cop also has a good leg kick. I should have put it up there, but that leg kick is nasty. And for a flyweight to be able to generate that much force on a kick, I love it. Um, something that I did like about Dvorak a little bit more than I like on Cop is his grappling, whether that's in the clinch or on the ground. So for Dvorak, he has those nice trips from the clinch. As he's walking a guy down, he will be, if he gets you into that clinch, he has some slick trips. Uh, yeah, slick trips. And when he gets on top of you afterwards, that ground and pound is nasty, um, as I pointed out there. So his grappling is good. He can get you with the submission. He can get you with the ground and pound. I do like that. So this matchup, here's what I see. I see at range, Manil Cop is going to have the advantage, not like massively, but it's going to be pretty hard to outstrike Manil Cop, you know, just at range. Dvorak, however, though, is going to put the pressure on him. And eventually we're going to run out of cage if Cop isn't able to keep it at range the whole time, which over the course of three five-minute rounds, I don't know that Cop can keep it at range the whole time. So when he gets close, that clinch and that grappling, I think it's going to favor Dvorak, who can hold his own in the striking. And I think we're going to be impressed by that because, like I said, he's coming off of the loss to Mateusz Nikolaou, but I think Nikolaou beats both of these guys. I don't think it's crazy to say that Nikolaou would also beat Manil Cop. So I don't think that's really, really crazy. Um... So for me, I don't think that's really... We can't really hold that against him too much in this matchup. So I'm going to say... If I for, if for the sake of making a pick, because I think Manil Kopp performs better in a ring than an octagon, I will ever so slightly lean Dvorak as the underdog. But something I like better than a straight pick on this one. I'm going to... For the sake of the pick, I'm taking Dvorak. I might be wrong. You can come back and tell me I'm an idiot if Manil Kopp knocks him out. I like the under two and a half if you can get that at a decent line. I don't know what that is right now. But if you can get the under two and a half at a decent line, I think somebody's getting a finish here because I think with the forward pressure and the uh, just constantly going forward style that Dvorak's going to bring with this extremely high-level striking that Manil Cobb has, if, with that nasty ground and pound that Dvorak has, somebody's probably getting a finish, and I think under two and a half is a pretty decent line to play. Um, so for me, that's the way I'm going to play this. Under two, or, uh, under two and a half, if I... Pressed for a pick. I'll take the Vorjak. Let me know what you guys think. I just, I lean slightly to the guy that that I know is is going to push the pace a little bit more um, and not take any rounds off or any time off. But like I said, it's a close fight. Betting it straight is really scary for me because this one is not, I mean, this could go either way, but I do really think that the under two and a half is a solid play. Let me know what you guys think. Let's get to the next fight. We've got some really good ones coming up. So this card is money all the way through. It is so much fun. I'm I've already got my root beers already in the fridge. They're cooling. They're just getting ready for Saturday. So we're going to crack open a bunch of them suckers on this card. It's going to be a great time. See you All next right, fight. So for this fight being a short notice replacement fight, I probably spent a little bit more time researching this one than some of the others because I think this is a hard one to predict on short notice. In this matchup at Welterweight, we have Brian Battle taking on Renat Fakrit Dinov. I think that's how you say that, Fakrit Dinov. Both guys 5-0 in their last five fights. 
Both of them clearly on, on a pretty good streak. So we got 20 and 2 overall for Fakhret Dinov, 8 and 1 for Battle. So neither guy is really lost very often. Both guys know what it's like to win. Both guys have shown that they that they have the tools to get it done in, in the UFC level. Um, competition wise, obviously Fakhret Dinov has fought way more times. I think Brian Battle's probably fought some of some some of the tougher matchups recently, anyway. Um, I do think this has been an interesting matchup, though, because especially because it is on short notice. And we're going to start with that. It is on short notice. So for Brian Battle, and I'm going to put this out there now, I think if this was a full camp for Brian Battle, I would be a lot more likely to pick Brian Battle just right away. I think he wins. But why would I say that? Well, because Brian Battle has shown every single fight he's improving. He's shown that he now is at welterweight, which is even a better weight for him than middleweight was. And he did well at middleweight, obviously. He was, you know, only had one loss in his career going into his first welterweight fight. So he was, what, 7-1 and one before that fight? So so for Brian Battle, he's improving. He's at a better weight class for him now. You know, he, ha he has a lot of the intangibles that you want out of a fighter. But the problem, this is short notice against a very tough opponent in Fakhret Dinov. So for, for Fakhret Dinov, we'll go back. We're going to cover Brian Battle again in a second. For Fakhret Dinov, he does have a bit of a height and reach disadvantage. Only one inch in the height, so no big deal there. Um... But he does have a, a three-inch reach disadvantage. Not crazy, but when he's already going to have trouble in the striking, I do think Brian, Brian Battle is by far the better striker of the two. Now, Fakhredinov has power. Uh, he, he, he can knock a guy out, right? Don't get me wrong. He can knock a guy out. But his striking is super awkward and loopy. Like this, I don't know how much of that you saw with the, with the way the camera's set up. His striking is not pretty. And it's, I won't say it's bad, though. Because it's effective. It works for his style because he can mix it in, make it look like he's getting ready to shoot a weird takedown or some something like that and, and hit you with the overhand or whatever. It works for him. He's he's obviously 20 and 2 for a reason. So it works for him. But it's not good. It's not good striking whatsoever. Brian Battle does have good striking. He strikes in combination. He's got good volume. He can snap up kicks like they're, you know, with no setup, just very quick, just bringing that kick to the head. You know, he, he works different levels at the same time. Body, head, legs you know, works, uh, works the different depths and, uh, okay, pause. So I, I'm going to explain something kind of like my coach always said. He's, uh, he always said that when you're striking with a, an opponent, you're checking a couple of different things. You're checking height, which is like head, body, legs, whatever you're checking width, which is coming around the outside. So if you're coming from the left or the right, you're checking the width and you're checking depth. So uh, for the depth, like say uh, a hook or an uppercut, for example, is not going to be have as much depth to a strike as say a cross or a front kick, for example. So you're checking your height, your width, and your depth. Brian Battle will check all three of those things in the same combination, and that is amazing. That's something that you don't see often in the UFC. You see it a lot in boxing, for example. You'll see guys throw combinations that that are body, head, you know, get your hooks, your uppercuts, and your straights all mixed in there. You don't see this much in the UFC because there's the threat of the takedown, things like that. Well, Brian Battle will strike like that, and I do really like that. So back to back to Brian Battle striking. It's very good. It's not as polished as someone like a Manel Cop that we covered in the last fight, but it's very good, especially against the level of competition he's fought so far. He's looked very, very crisp. One thing I don't like is he does get hit in the face a lot. His striking defense is great, but we've seen that he has a good chin, and that's because he gets hit in the face quite a bit. I don't think that he's going to have to worry too much about Fakhret Dinov hitting him in the face a lot because I, I don't – well, first off, I don't think Fakhret Dinov is going to land a ton of strikes against Brian Battle. He is going to win. He's going to use his grappling to do so. That's where his, his bread gets butter is the grappling. Um, for for Battle, though, he's not, he's not lost on the ground either. He has good grappling, and he does have really slick transitions. He can move – you know, from one position to the other, pretty fluid without having to really kind of muscle it and wear himself out too bad. Um, and we, we've seen him get up off the mat multiple times before when he's been taken down. But he does have mid-level takedown defense. It's not the best. And I think the reason why, the reason why it's not the best is because his striking is very crisp. And when he's using these strikes in combination like that, it's really hard to be ready to stuff a takedown at a, a moment's notice. So for Brian Battle's takedown defense, it's it's kind of a little diminished because he puts more into the striking. And I understand that it works well for him, uh, obviously so far. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't dislike that at all. The mid level takedown defense is going to be hard for him in, in this matchup, especially without having the training camp to prepare. But one thing I do like about battle is he can put knees up the middle. Th he'll throw uppercuts. He'll throw, you know, he'll throw his kicks through the middle 
as well when need be with a front kick or a teep kick, something like that. So for battle, that's going to be good against a guy like Fakhradinov. And the, the biggest problem, and I haven't seen anybody else on, on YouTube break this down. I had an extra day. Um, I don't know if you guys saw my, my community post or whatever, but the rain made it so I couldn't record my videos yesterday. I know that sounds crazy uh, as we've got an airplane flying over my head. I have a metal roof, so bear with me. It gets loud when it rains. Um, so anyway, what I was saying, so for Fakhra Dinov, the biggest issue I see with him, and I, I haven't heard anybody mention it. Maybe somebody has. I just didn't see their video. It's okay. It's what happens. He just dips his head, at, bends at the... I know you can't see what I'm doing all the way. He dips his head, bends at the waist, and shoots forward with a takedown. It's When you're shooting a takedown, my coach always said you want to keep your eyes and head up and use your legs to get low. I understand my coach is not in the UFC and Fakhr Dinov is. So I get that. But I'm just going off of what I understand is that if you just dip your head like this and go for the for the takedown, if you just dip your head straight down bending at the waist, yeah, you might be able to get a hold of those legs quickly. But the problem is you, you could get kicked or knees square in the face and not even know it's coming other than, oh, hey, that it, oh, there it is, I'm out. Or also you don't see where the hands are doing. So you don't see whether you're getting hit with a hook or you didn't see my hook you get getting hooked with a low hook you're getting your head shoved to the side he's the way he shoots his takedowns although he has great takedowns really strong wrestling his entry is weird to me and i don't know that i don't know that i think that brian battle on a full camp would take advantage of that no problem in this matchup i don't know um back to what we were saying anyway so brian battle amazing cardio We've got good cardio over on the fucker dino side i don't think anybody's gonna be too too gassed out to continue to fight this can be no problem but the one other thing that I think that I like about Fakhradinov in this matchup is that against the cage, he is nasty. He makes everything count against the cage. This matchup is so hard for me to pick. And like I said, if this was a full camp, I'd be all over the Brian Battle side. I'm gonna be gosh, I'm I'm gonna this the slightest bit. Oh, I'm gonna lean Fakhradinov right now. Oh, just because just because oh. Just because I know that Brian Battle has not had a full camp for this. He has not been able to prepare. He has not had time to really analyze the game plan of Fakhradinov. He's probably spending most of this time cutting the weight. Because of that, I'm going to slightly re lean Fakhradinov. I want Brian Battle to win this fight. I like Brian Battle. He's a funny guy. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Brian Battle style. That's all he does. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? That's his interviews right there. Uh, he's a likable guy. He's funny-ish. You know, uh, He's just goofy, all right? Uh, I, I would like to see Brian Battle get this win. I just don't think... I think the short notice this is a really tough match on short notice, so I'm going to lean Fakhradinov. But like I said, this is a closer fight than than whatever... I have no idea what the odds are, but this is probably a closer fight than the odds are suggesting, and I think Brian Battle is very, very likely to get this win. I just think the short, short notice is a little bit too much. I might change my mind. Keep an eye on the Twitter because I will tweet it out if I change my mind. I, I certainly might. Might even be right before the fight starts, but bear with me. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. I spent way too much time breaking this fight down. Let's get to the next All one. All right, so trying again. Uh, we've had quite a few airplanes fly overhead. And I've re this is restarting the video for time number four. If an airplane flies overhead again, we're just leaving it in. Anyway, to the fight. At lightweight, we have Rafa Garcia taking on Maha Shata. Maha Shata 5-0 is in his last five fights. He's looked like a world beater in the short bit we've seen of him. Uh, his last fight in the UFC, uh, his only fight in the UFC, actually, won with a devastating right hand. On the other side, Rafa Garcia, two and three in his last five. He's much better than that two and three suggests. He came, he's coming in off of a loss to uh, Dracar Close. Close is a tough fighter. I believe he did take that fight on short notice, so that's another another reason that's going to be kind of a, you know, you kind of give him a, almost a pass. Not a pass, but a little bit. You kind of understand uh, so before that, he was on a two-fight win streak over uh, Jesse Ronson and Natan Levy. The Levy win has aged fairly well, I think. Uh, Jesse Ronson, I mean, say what you will about Jesse Ronson. It's still tough to submit the guy. So for Rafa Garcia, he's kind of a decent all-arounder. He does everything well enough, nothing poorly, nothing ex exceptionally well, but he does everything well enough. Uh, he does have good forward pressure, and he he's going to fight for your money. He's a guy that's going to go out there, and he's going to do whatever he's got to do to get the win, and he's not just going to give up on you, okay? So, Rafa Garcia, I do like him as a fighter. I think he's a good benchmark for a guy that's up and coming, like Mahashata. If Mahashata can get by uh, Rafa Garcia, I think we're going to see some, you know, some quick movement up the cards. If Mahashata, Mahashata gets through him in the way that he did in his last fight against Gar the other Garcia. For Mahashata, though, 
he's much larger here. He's, he's six foot tall with a 71 and a half inch reach. That is massive compared to the 5'7", 68 inch reach of Garcia. He's going to, so Garcia's going to have to enter the danger zone way before he can can actually inflict damage upon Mahashata. And with that guy being six foot tall, okay, I'm 5'8", for disclosure here. He's 5'7". I know that if I'm throwing a punch at somebody that's six foot tall, I'm, whew, that is, that is, that is not easy to do because not only, I've explained this in many videos, so I'm going to breeze through it this time. Not only do I have the reach disadvantage of whatever, three and a half inches to deal with or whatever it is, you also have, you're losing some of your reach by going up to hit your opponent because their head is up. So if he's trying to land a, sh a, a head shot on Mahashata at six foot, I know me at five, eight, looking up at somebody six foot, it's not easy to hit those guys. I've sparred with those guys. It's hard because they always have arm reach, but they also are up higher. So it, you lose your reach. So Mahashata is going to be able to inflict damage on Garcia much earlier than Garcia is going to be able to inflict damage on Mahashata. Mahashata does have some good... I keep saying his name. I get, I'm going to chill a little bit on that. He's got good boxing. He's got good counters. And he's got that laser right hand, that super powerful shot. Drop you. Just put, you, put your lights out. We saw it in the last fight. A lot of his fights... I don't really know who, which ones were which off the top of my head. Uh, they're hard to find his fights. I did find some of them. They are harder to find, but I did find some of them from, from his stuff when I was looking at him for the uh, Contender Series. But anyway, for Mahashata here, I do think that he's going to be able to get this one done against Garcia. Garcia can beat him. There's a world where Garcia comes through that danger zone, gets him to the ground. I'm going to make the pick of Mahashata, but realistically for me, I'm just going to crack open a root beer, kick my feet up on the coffee table, and just watch this fight. I'm not at, I'm not confident enough in, in Mahashata from the limited sample size that I've seen to put a bet on him. And I'm not confident enough in Garcia in the up and down path we've seen in the UFC so far that he can beat a guy like Mahashata who may be better than I think he is. So for me, the pick to me, Mahashata, not confident in it. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Let's go to the next one. And thankfully there were no planes this time. All right, next guys, fight. This fight is so exciting that I, this might be the main event of the card in my mind. This fight is wild, all right? So we've got Saeed Nurmagomedov taking on Saeed Yukub Kakramanov. Now, in this matchup, at the in the Bantamweight division, in this matchup, we have two guys, both 4-1 and one in their last five fights, who are looking to be some of the better prospects in the Bantamweight division that are on their way up. The winner of this, I see very big things for them in the near future. The loser of this doesn't really take a big step back, but they're going to have to rebuild from that spot where they left off. They're not going to drop down. I think they're going to stay right where they are, but the other guy's going to go up pretty quickly after this fight. So for this one here, we see a couple of different things then you're probably, everybody's going to point this out. Nurmagomedov, he's not related to the other Nurmagomedovs from what I understand, or like the Khabibs and all them, whatever. Point is, same last name, doesn't matter. He's a very high level striker, okay? Now he can grapple, we'll get into that, but he is a very high level striker, particularly his kicks. Standard kicks, you know, like he's got his like roundhouse kicks and things like that, but he also does very nice spinning kicks that are accurate, pinpoint accurate to be exact and he can put them where he can put them where he wants them with speed precision power they're they're very nice same his his hands you know got good punching combination but those kicks those are those are where it's at his kicking game is very very high level striking overall is very high level but there you go he does have good takedown defense as well uh whether that is locking up a submission on the way down as we saw against uh cody stamen i believe it was or if it's just stuffing the takedown working the fight from the feet so you're Nurmagomedov, not your typical Nurmagomedov, as they say, but uh, but he does have really good grappling once it does get to the mat. He's not lost on the ground. You'd think someone that's a high-level striker, once the fight gets to the ground, that, oh, maybe he's not as good. False. Dude can grapple, very, very talented on the ground, but he's not the one typically shooting the takedowns, but if it gets there, he can grapple. Something I like about Sayyid Sur Nurmagomedov, a lot of the guys that throw these, like, big spinning kicks or whatever, a lot of them are very wild. He's not necessarily... He looks for his opening. He's patient, if you will. He finds his spots. I do like that about Nurmagomedov here. I also like that he has the cardio to go all three rounds while still doing all these wild, not wild, I guess, but all these like big, heavy movement kicks. I don't know if you've ever done like a spinning heel kick. Try one sometime. You're probably going to get out of breath pretty quick. Uh, it, it takes a lot of energy, okay? So for Nurmagomedov to be able to do this in a fight multiple times and be able to carry on through the, the whole 
15 minutes of a, of a three round fight and still be able to do that in the third round. That's impressive. A lot of, if you watch MMA fights regularly, you maybe you haven't taken note of this, but look at, look at MMA fights, especially with guys that are heavy kickers early in a fight towards the end of a fight, especially if it's been fought at a fast pace, kicks start to become a rarity. You see more punches because this takes way less effort than picking your leg up off the ground. So for example, uh, you got a matchup between a couple of strikers. First round, both guys out there throwing big kicks or whatever. Third, well, if they have championship rounds, fourth, fifth round, whatever. There's not a lot of kicks. Yes, they happen. Some guys still do it. But those kicks, the numbers of kicks drop down. I'm sure there's a stat out there somewhere. If somebody can find that stat and put it in the comments of like what percentage more kicks are thrown in the first round as opposed to like a third round of a fight. If you can find that stat, that'd be amazing. Let me know. Uh, cite your sources, please. But there we go. On to the other side for Sayed Yakub, Kakramanov. For Kakramanov here, very strong wrestling. So he has what you expect from a typical person with the name Nurmagomedov. But in, in, instead, Kakramanov in this one, he's going to be the wrestler. His wrestling is, is very high level. Uh, he can strike well as well. He does get a little reckless with his strikes sometimes. Um, I noticed a lot more in his regional regional fights than than so far in the UFC. Uh, I think he's been a little bit more. Uh, I guess he's he's kind of done pretty darn well recently, but but he he does get a little bit wild with his strikes. His wrestling though, that's where it's at. So for for Kakramanov, he's gonna put a pace on you. He's gonna use that cardio as as a weapon. At, walk through whatever you've got with that chin. Uh, we saw that in in his PFL fight against the another Nurmagomedov, where he he got kicked square in the face multiple times, and man, he just kind of brushed it off like it wasn't a big deal. Um, and he's an aggressive fighter, so he's gonna come forward, use that wrestling, use that pace, strike on the way in, get you with the takedowns. He's very, very skilled at those things. And I think in a three-round fight, that's going to play well for him because I don't think you're going to have any worry about him burning out. Yeah, guys, this matchup is going to be... This matchup, I'm going to say, probably goes to decision. I don't see either guy getting put out. Uh, that's a tough call to make, though. Uh, picking a guy... Picking someone in this fight is... I'm only doing it for the sake of the video, Okay. Because this, this fight is the definition of kick your feet up on the coffee table, crack open a couple of root beers. You got one in each hand. You got a couple ready on the side for when these run out. You're just watching this one because this is going to be a fun fight from the time it starts to the time it ends. Unless both guys are nervous and both just stare at each other. I don't think so. I'm going to ever so slightly lean the Kakraman side, but the slightest bit. And I'm, I've switched my pick a couple of times today already. Kakramanov, I'm going to pick him. I think his wrestling is just too too deadly. The way he ragdolls people, I think he's going to be able to use that mixed in with that striking that he has. And he's shown that he's got a good chin, so maybe he eats a kick to the face and walks right through it like he did against the other Nurmagomedov in, uh, over in PFL. So for me, I'm going to take Kakramanov. Yes, he lost that PFL fight. It was a decision, so maybe. But... I do think Kakramanov is going to be able to get this one done, but I'm not confident in whatsoever. Would not bet on this one. if I, I, This is the last fight on the card I would bet on. Last one. But there's no... I, I would bet on every other fight before this one. So whatever. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know who you got. I've got Sayed Akud Kakramanov. I probably butchered his name. Whatever. Anyway, right, next Tough fight. matchup to call in the middleweight division here. We have Duran Wynn taking on Julian Marquez. Marquez, 3-2 and two in his last five fights. Win is 2-3 and three in his last five. Now, this one's a tough one to call for a different reason than our last fight. The other guys, usually I pick both of them to win. This one, I usually pick against both of these guys in most matchups. I mean, if you're fighting Sam, you know, Sam Alvey, I'm not going to pick against gonna pick against you. So there's that. But in most of these guys' matchups, I'd probably pick against them. In this matchup here, this is tough. <laughs> it's really tough. So... Obviously, there's a massive height uh, and reach disadvantage. Well, not a massive reach, but a massive height disadvantage for Duran Wynn. He's always going to be the shorter fighter at middleweight. It's just the way it is. Nobody else is 5'6 at middleweight. And if they are, their coach is probably saying, why don't you lose some weight, dude? You're 5'6. So I don't know what's up with Duran Wynn. He's just short and chubby. It's just the way it is. Something about Duran Wynn, though, he does have really high-level wrestling, and that top pressure is pretty solid. So I will give that to him. Uh a decent overhand not really that good but just the fact that like he's able to set it up because they're afraid of the takedown it's there but the guy can't defend a strike because well he gets hit from so far away he's reaching like crazy to try to hit somebody else in the face i mean six foot two to five foot six are you kidding me so yeah draw win just not good on the feet 
wouldn't expect him to win much if it stays in a striking battle. There's a world where he takes Marquez down, lays on him, and gets a victory that way. Uh, on the other hand, Julian Marquez. He's a very explosive power striker. He's tough, sets a good pace. But uh, and something I didn't write up here, but I probably should have mentioned. He can be deadly with the chokes. He has quite a few wins by choke as of recent, actually. Um, in various different kinds. Like, you got the Anaconda choke, you got the guillotines, whatever. He can mix in different chokes. Uh, with a guy like Deron Wynn who's shooting takedowns like that. So Marquez could get the win that way. I think Deron Wynn's going to be smart enough to stay away from that. But anyway, it's a thing. Marquez could do it. I didn't write it up here. I probably should have, but whatever. Marquez also doesn't defend strikes super well. He just eats them. Um, and then his takedown defense isn't great. So Deron Wynn could get the takedown, lay on him for three rounds, get the win there. Julian Marquez could just punch Deron Wynn in the face and flatline him because Deron Wynn has to cross so much distance just to get it. I hate this fight. This one is so... I want to pick against both of them. I want to pick against both of them, but I'm not going to. I'm going to pick Julian Marquez. I think he's going to get the win, but only because I just don't think Duran wins UFC caliber, at least not at middleweight. If the guy decided to, you know, get on the Atkins diet or whatever, I don't think that's still around. Weight Watchers, maybe. Get himself on some Weight Watchers. Drop off a bunch of, bunch of that extra belly fat and uh, the man boobies that he's carrying around. If he could, cuts that... Even to 170, the guy really should be like, if he's 5'6", I can't imagine fighting anything higher than 155, but get him down to even 170. He has good enough wrestling that I think maybe he's got a shot there. But no, I'm going to take Julian Marquez for that reason. I don't think Deron Wynn's going to get a whole lot of wins in the in the UFC. So Marquez is the pick. Not confident in it. Hate this fight. Well, Let's go to match up next between Jake Matthews and Matt Semmelsberger. In this matchup, Semmelsberger, 2-3 and three in his last five, 4-1 and one for Matthews. His lone loss there was that Sean Brady loss before everybody just kind of forgot about Sean Brady after Bilal Muhammad beat him. I, I don't think it's a bad loss. So 4-1 and one in his last five, 3-2 and two for Semmelsberger. Also pretty, pretty darn good lately. I want to take a quick moment to, to give a little bit of credit where it's due for Jake Matthews. This dude's been in the UFC since 2014. He's only 28 years old currently. So 2014, he was just a just a wee one. He was still just a just a young little lad. But Jake Matthews been in the UFC since June, I think it was of 2014. Don't quote me on the month, but I think it was June of 14. I don't know what you guys were doing in June of 2014, but I wasn't doing crap. I was working at a gas station in June of 2014. This dude was fighting in the UFC. So for him to still have an 18 and five record after getting to the UFC so young, that is super impressive to me. So. Jake Matthews, like, look at that guy go. Uh, anyway, easy to do, do research on his fights, though, because most of them have been in the UFC over the last, what, eight years or so? Almost nine. So Jake Matthews, 4-1 in his last five, 3-2 on the Semmelsberger side. Let's get back to the fight. A bit of a height and reach advantage for the, the Semmelsberger side. He's just a little taller. He's 6-1 as opposed to the 5-11 for Matthews. 75-inch reach as opposed to the 72 for Matthews. Uh, Semmelsberger is... He's an athletic striker, a very tough athletic striker who can wrestle um, at a high level. I would say a pretty high level. He mixes it all together very well. Simmelsberger's a, a tough matchup for just about anybody, but not so good that he's going to win against the top level of competition. He's a good, like, middle-of-the-card kind of guy. He's going to beat everybody that doesn't belong there. He's going to lose to, some, you know, some people that – most of the people that do belong at the top top, but – he might even upset some of those because of the way he fights, he can put it on you with that athletic striking, catch you with something. His wrestling is solid, like I said. So Matthew Semmelsberger is probably going to win fights that you don't expect him to win. I don't know that this one's that fight because he's on the cross from him is Jake Matthews, who has been around the UFC, like I said, for a very long time now. He does have some pretty darn good boxing, and he's got power in his hands. And that's something that's actually developed recently. He wasn't known for his power when he came in through the Ultimate Fighter Nations all those many years ago. If you remember the Ultimate Fighter Nations, let me know in the comments. Uh, but with that, he, he's got solid wrestling and grappling, which he's always kind of had, but it's also developed so much more over the last eight years in the UFC. A lot of guys, when they get to the UFC, that's it. That's where their development stops. That's their finished product. That is it. Jake Matthews has really developed since he's been in the UFC, which, like I said, is really impressive that he's been able to amass this record while spending the last eight years or so in the UFC. Name another guy that's done that. Yes, there are some, but it's tough to do that and then find somebody that's also not in the top five. He also isn't super active, so there is that. But either way, 
in this matchup here, I think it goes one of two ways. One, Jake Matthews dominates the fight, wins the fight that way. Two, Jake Matthews dominates most of the fight. Matthew Semmelsberger gives us a couple of really scary moments if you're betting Jake Matthews at the minus like 250 or whatever it is. And maybe 275 at this point, I don't know. And then you say, what's going on? And Matthew Semmelsberger makes you sweat. Jake Matthews pulls it out or doesn't because Matthew Semmelsberger is a tough guy to fight. Like I said, that athletic striking can catch you. Uh, and that wrestling's pretty darn good. I don't think the wrestling's going to be his path to victory here, though. If Matthew Semmelsberger wants to win, it is with that athletic striking. Flying knees, wild elbows, you know, spinning elbows, whatever. Those type of things are going to be able to get the job done. The guy played football before going into MMA. So, so some of the athleticism is there. Football typically has better just pure athletes than you would say for fighters because typically if you can go make millions of dollars in the NFL or you can make like thousands of dollars in the UFC, well, you're probably going to take the millions of dollars in the NFL. Samuelsberg wasn't at that level. Obviously, he's not he's not like you know, playing in the NFL or anything, but just saying football is going to attract the better athletes typically than fighters. Not always, but typically. For Jake Matthews, though, I do think he's going to get the win here. He is going to be my pick for this fight. I do think Semmelsberger will give us a few moments, though, that's going to make us sweat that sweat that out. So if you're betting the Matthews side, just be ready to sweat a little bit. You know, just get ready to uh, get ready to freak out and get your heart racing for a few minutes when uh, Semmelsberger hits him with something. Then you're, you know, gonna gonna have your heart skip a beat. Round's gonna end. You're gonna, oh, is he gonna come out okay in the next round? I don't know. Either way, something like that. I'm gonna take Jake Matthews. If it goes past a minute, I do think Jake Matthews is gonna have a few spots where he sweats though. So that's my thought. Let me know what you guys think. I will see you in the, in the women's strawweight division. We have Cheyenne Velismas taking on Corey McKenna. Both ladies with an identical record of 7-2, and 4-1 and one in their last five. Now, for Corey McKenna, she has a 58.5-inch reach, which is going to be short. It's the shortest reach in the UFC. So 63 inches on the side of Elizma. She's going to have a clear reach advantage here. Corey McKenna knows this. She's got T-Rex arms. It's not her fault. There isn't a weight class lower than this. They don't have Adam weight in the UFC. If they did, maybe that'd be a spot for her. She's just small. It's just the way it is. There's nothing she can do about it. So she's going to have to figure that out for her career. She's done well so far, 7-2. and two, Not a bad record. So for Corey McKenna here, she, her and Velizmas, both, they're good at each other's weaknesses. So for this fight, it's basically going to be the striking of Cheyenne Velizmas because she does have good striking and good volume against the wrestling of Corey McKenna. Corey McKenna does have good volume on the feet. It won't really matter too much, I don't think, because, well... The striking is going to be on the Velisma side, and Corey McKenna is going to be looking for the takedown if she's smart. So that's what we've got. We got wrestling versus striking. The difference here: striking defense is poor for McKenna. For Velisma, she can be controlled up against the cage, and when she, and her takedown defense isn't so, isn't very good. It's not very good. So for me, this matchup is very interesting because, like I said, both ladies are uh, good at the other one's weakness. For me, I tend to lean for the grappler. So for me, I want to lean the Corey McKenna side. I know she's a decent sized underdog right now. So if you're looking for an underdog on this card, that's a good spot because I do think Corey McKenna wins this at least 50% of the time, but probably more wrestlers do tend to beat strikers that have poor takedown defense because once you, once you get the fight to the mat, that's it. The striker doesn't have any answers if they can't get back up when it's a striker versus someone who's not that good of a striker. Even every time the strike is thrown, there's still the chance of getting taken to the mat. The, there's still the chance the wrestler is striking back. But when a wrestler gets a striker to the mat, it's like when you take a fish out of water. It just can't breathe. So for, for Corey McKenna, she does have the wrestling, which is going to control where the fight goes. She can be able to hold the striker down or up against the cage. But preferably for McKenna, if she gets it to the ground, she'll do better because it's much easier to separate from the cage than it is to get up off the, off the ground. Uh, but for Elizabeth Sears, there's a world where she just keeps at range, kind of boxes poor Corey McKenna's face in with her tiny little T-Rex arms. Uh, but no, I do like Corey McKenna in this matchup. Let me know what you guys think, because this is a, kind of a fun one to, to, to see what lady is going to be able to move her way back up, you know, keep going up the ranks or whatever, and which one's going to kind of just fall back down to the lower levels. So for me, McKenna, let me know what you got quick, we'll before we jump time. into this. I want to point out something quick. I want you guys to let me know what you think in the comments. When I say that, I actually mean give me your opinions on these fights. Let me know what you think. I'm always willing to discuss it with you in the comments. Now, if you're being a dick, I'm not going to, I'm just going to, you know, forget about you or whatever. But I'm always open to discussion. Now, there's a lot of these channels that you see out there that 
if you give them an opposing opinion in the comments, they'll tell you you're stupid and, you know, tell you, get you know, whatever, don't be dumb, all this crap. I want to hear your opinion because for me, I'm here to help you guys make good bets. I'm here to help you guys get a better take on the fights going into them. I'm here to give you some information. So if you've got a take that's different than mine, A, maybe I can learn something. Maybe I can say, oh, I missed that in my, in my tape study. Thank you for bringing that to me. Or I can say, hey, no, I see where you're going from, but this is why that's not the way that it is and then you can better go back and look at that and say oh yeah maybe he was right maybe that 138 mma guy knew what he was talking about but i'm here for the open discussion so don't be afraid to tell me what you think in the comments i'm not going to tell you you're stupid unless you're playing being a dick because then i'm going to tell you you're stupid and we can settle it but but anyway without any further ado let's get into this fight here because this should be a fun one i do like this matchup we got cody brundage eight and two three and two in his last five fights Take it on Michael Olesheshuk, I think is how you say that. I don't know. I think that's how you say that. How you say that. So that's what I'm going to say. 17 and 5 and 3 and 2 in his last 5. Now, the record is a bit deceptive on the Brundage side because he's 3 and 2. And in fact, I backed him in his last two fights because he was fighting Treshawn Gore and Dolce Lungambola. Two guys that I don't think are actually UFC caliber. Yes, they're decent fighters. They're probably a better fighter than me. I'm not a middleweight either. So that's not what I'm saying. But I just don't think they're UFC caliber. So I backed Brundage in both of those. But he didn't look great in either of those fights. The whole He looked bad until he didn't. Then I put that out here. He looks bad until he doesn't. So for Brundage, ah, I can't trust him very much. On the other side, we have Michael Ojeshuk, who's basically a striker. He does have power. He has speed. He is a to solid striker that's what he is he's a solid striker he does have decent offensive wrestling when he needs it um defense wrestling not really the best but i think in this matchup brundage is usually willing to trade for a little bit at least that's not going to be good for him he does have power don't get me wrong brundage can put your lights out we've seen it before um that that solid wrestling background that he has i think is probably his best path to victory i just don't know that he's going to use it soon enough so for for this matchup a guy with Poor striking defense in Brundage, taking on short notice, and who tends to look bad until he doesn't. Yeah, he's got a puncher's chance. I'm probably going to pass on the fight with the odds the way that they are. But I do think all this Chuck is going to be the better pick here. I think he's going to win this fight. Let me know what you guys think. I actually want to hear what you guys think. I will go back and forth with you in the comments if it's worth talking back and forth. If we just agree, then great. You get the little heart thing or whatever that is, and I'll say we agree. But... Tell me what you think. I would love to hear about it. Let's get on the next fight. A couple of really, really good ones are coming up. In fact, three of my favorite fighters are on this card. Some of them are coming up right around the corner. So let's talk about those. All in right. Next so in this next matchup at lightweight, we have Drew Dober taking on Bobby Green. Bobby Green, two and three in his last five fights, three and two for Dober. Something to make, make note of quick. Bobby Green coming off of a six-month suspension, uh, banned substance, test positive for it or whatever. I don't know that it's going to be a big deal. I don't think that it will. Maybe it is something that benefits, that still is benefiting him. Maybe it's something that is no longer benefiting him and actually is a hindrance. Or maybe it'll play no bearing on this fight whatsoever. Either way, Bobby Green coming off a six-month suspension. Whatever. Point it out there. Uh, also, quick disclaimer, Drew Dober is one of my favorite fighters in the UFC. If you haven't seen that video, I'll make it on the end screen here. But uh, So I might be a slight bit biased, but I did my best to break this down without being biased. So... Anyway, without any more wasted talking, this matchup, Bobby Green has a slight two-inch height advantage and a one-inch reach advantage. Nothing crazy there, but a little bit. Um, he has very good boxing. For Bobby Green, I would say almost even better. His striking defense is almost even better than his striking offense, and his striking offense is good. Um, for Bobby Green, he will work behind the jab, work the one-two. He'll snap him up from low, hit you when you, you don't see him coming. He slips punches very effortlessly blocks punches but not in the chris curtis like shell up let him hit your arm style he blocks punches with like a quick you know uh push to the side as he's slipping over there and hitting you with something else he's a little more finesse and a little less like walk through your shots and block okay so his blocking the shots is a little bit different he slips more than he does he, you know hits blocks him with the shoulder roll sometimes you hear about that so for bobby green his his boxing is super crisp I do think that his striking defense is even better than his striking offense, which is really important in a matchup like this because he's got a guy like Dover standing across from him who does have some pretty darn good Muay Thai. Um, but for, for Bobby Green, when he got to MMA originally, it was his wrestling that carried him. Now, we have not seen that in a long time. 
But Bobby Green got into MMA using wrestling. If you, there was some documentary about Bobby Green that came out. I don't remember where or when or I remember watching it though. And I hear in there Bobby Green talking about how he didn't really know how to strike at all. And he was a wrestler when he got into MMA and that carried him in his first however many fights. But even when he first got to the UFC, uh, he was still using his wrestling to, at, at that point. We haven't seen it in a long time, but he does have good wrestling. I don't know if he still has those skills, if they're as sharp as they used to be. But if he does, that might be a good path to victory because Drew Dober can be taken down. That is something that, that, that is a weakness of his. I didn't write it up there, but it is a weakness of his that he can be taken down. I didn't write it up there because I don't think that Bobby Green is going to shoot any takedowns. That's just not what he does. He's not a takedown guy. He's a boxer at this point in his career. But anyway, for Bobby Green, his the way he slips punches and strikes back with his, he does that at a very high level. And he can do that for an entire fight. The one problem, yes, he has the cardio to go whole fight, but the problem is that first round, he starts real slow. For Bobby Green, he's going to start off the fight. He's going to do it at a nice casual pace. But as the fight goes on, he starts to get that groove going. He'll start tagging guys with those straight punches, the one-two, just walking you down with them, you know, dodging one of your shots, striking back. Bobby Green's really crisp with his boxing. So but he doesn't start off quick enough to win all three rounds in most cases. So for Bobby Green, I do think he's going to win the third round of this fight if it does get there. So I'm going to put that out there now. I do think Bobby Green wins the third round if it gets to the third round. On the other side, we have Drew Dober. He's primarily a Muay Thai style guy. Uh, he does have power. He does have cardio. He puts a crazy pace on you. People are like, oh, he gasses out. The pace that he puts on you, I don't think he has bad cardio whatsoever. He just puts such a crazy pace on a guy that that the fact that he still exists in the third round is incredible with how much he just goes forward and gets into a war. Um, and also, he's the best chin in the UFC. There is nobody in the UFC that pound for pound has a better chin than Drew Dober. I think his chin holds up at any weight class at this point. If you saw the Terrence McKenney fight and you saw what he was hit with by Terrence McKenney, and you don't think that Drew Dober has the best chin in the UFC, you're out of your mind. I hate to say it, you're out of your mind. That chin is legendary. So anyway, but Drew Dober, dude can get hit with a truck and probably just be fine. You could take a sledgehammer and wind that thing up and smack him right across the face. He probably wouldn't even go down. He might fall down, but he'll get right back up. Either way, I'm exaggerating here, but Drew Dober has got a hell of a chin. I don't think because Bobby Green, he, he does have that finesse style boxing. He doesn't have a ton of power, as I pointed out here. And it's not that he can't put guys down. I don't think he's putting a guy like Drew Dober down, though. So that chin's going to hold up. So if Bobby Green wins, it's going to be by decision. And we already know that Bobby Green is probably going to win the third round. So he's banking one. The problem is he's a slow starter. Dober is not. So Dober is not going to gonna wait around for Bobby Green to get those sea legs going. You know what I mean? Drew Dober is going to win the first round. We've got that covered. So Dober's going to win the first round. Bobby Green's going to win the third round. This leads us to the second round. What do we got? If it goes to the decision, we're just talking about if it goes to the decision right now. If it goes to the decision right now, who's going to win the second round? I think that's close. However, when I'm picking this fight, Bobby Green's not going to finish Drew Dober. Drew Dober can finish Bobby Green. Because of that, because all the, the finishing upside is on the Dober side, we know Dober's probably going to win the first round, and we know Green's probably going to win the third. Both of them have a pretty good shot at winning the second round. I'm going to take the guy with the finishing upside. So I'm going to pick Dober in this matchup. Yes, I, like I said, I'm a little bit biased. I do really like watching Dober fights. I'm a fan of his. I don't know him personally or anything like that. I just think he's a heck of a fun fighter to watch. So anybody that watches him probably thinks that. Bobby Green is also fun to watch, but don't get me wrong. He's just, he's like, Bobby Green fights are exciting. Drew Dober fights are next level exciting. So I do, I do like Drew Dober here. Um, I pick him in the matchup. I think he's got the finishing upside. If you want to play Bobby Green by decision, that's the way to play Bobby Green. If you're going to play Dober, I mean, I got almost got to play money line because it could be decision or it could be could be a submission, could be TKO, could be KO. I mean, KO, TKO, same, same line, but whatever. Either way, point is, Dober's got a couple of different paths to victory here, but I do think Bobby Green has... If he wins, it's going to be by decision. So for me, I'm playing Dober. I like the pass to victory. I like the explosiveness. I like the power. I like the extreme the just pace that he's going to put on you from the start of the fight all the way through. He may have hard, a hard time hitting Bobby Green, though. And if that ends up being the case, yeah, Bobby Green's got a real shot at winning this fight. So for me, I'm picking Drew Dober. 
not like a lock or anything, but I'm leaning that way. Let me know what you guys think. The next fight is super exciting, so you let's get over know. there. It's time. My guy, Juicy J, Julian Arosa. You know where I'm picking, but I'm going to break this fight down either way. My guy, he's 4-1 in his last five fights. He's taking on Alex Caceres, who I'm also a very big fan of. Also 4-1 in his last five fights. These guys, both of them are two of my favorite fighters in the UFC. But ain't nobody topping my guy, Juicy J. So, anyway, in this matchup, Alex Caceres. He's 5'10 with a 73 and a half inch reach. He's used to being kind of the taller, rangier fighter. But in this matchup, he's not. Julian Rosa, 6'1", 74 and a half inch reach. So, not a big difference in the height and reach. But he's there. And that's going to maybe pose some problems for Alex Caceres. But then again, I guess he just recently beat Chase Hooper, who... Pretty much has a height and reach advantage over everybody. So there's that. So I guess maybe not. But it is there. We're pointing it out. In this matchup, we have a couple of guys, though. Both of them are, are talented at what they do. But both of them have glaring weaknesses. So first things first, Alex Caceres, solid Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He's got them choking arms. I've talked about them before, the choking arms. They're tiny little forearms that slip right under your neck. They ah, just string you up real quick. The big meaty forearms, some of, the, some of y'all have big meaty forearms. Those are hard to get under somebody's neck. Why is that? Well, because these don't fit under there as easy. They're too big. They take up too much space. He's got choking arms. Those long skinny arms are great for choking people out. On the other hand, he's also a good striker, but he has the tr kind of like traditional martial arts style striking, like your, your Taekwondo or your Kung Fu or your karate styles. He kind of does a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but he, he has that more like traditional kind of martial artsy style of striking and it works really well for him he's got the good kicks his punches are there um, he can get into a scrap with you probably the worst idea in this fight but he can't get into a scrap with you if needed but he's got good movement as well the problem though he doesn't have a ton of power so the glaring weakness here for Alex Caceres is he doesn't really have a ton of power he's not going to be able to put a guy like Julian Arosa down I don't think uh, but he's but he does have he does have good strikes, and if he can use those to set up maybe a takedown and use his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, he's got a shot there at winning this fight. On the other hand, Julian Arosa, the dude's got good striking. He does have power. The problem, though, he'll walk forward with his hands down by his waist like he doesn't care. He'll take shots straight on the chin and just to throw one back, which in a lot of fights is a horrible idea, but it works for him. The guy's 4-1 in his last five fights. Uh, so uh, what was it? Like, Sung Woo Choi was the one that got him, that knocked him out. I think uh, I could be wrong about that, but I think it was Sung Woo Choi. But either way, Julian Arosa, the dude just takes one on the chin, throws back with power, and he puts most guys down. Most people are going to break before Julian Arosa does, and that's one of the reasons this guy's my favorite fighter in the UFC. This guy is so fun to watch. Dude's got good grappling too, though. He's also got them long, skinny, choking arms. So for Julian Arosa, a lot of guys he'll be piecing them up on the feet with these wild punches. And they're going to try and shoot a uh, takedown on him. He just cinches up a choke and puts him to sleep right there. The dude's got dog in him. The guy does, he fights for your money. Typically, he is the underdog too. So that makes a lot of sense. But in this fight, he is the favorite. I am overexposed to Julian Arosa. I'm not going to spend a ton of time breaking down this fight because you know I'm biased. You know who I'm picking. Let me know who you're picking. But I'm overexposed. You can tell, you can, you can let it be known. If Julian Arosa wins his fight, I'm up on the card regardless of how everything else turns out. If he loses on this fight, I'm probably down on this card, regardless of how everything else turns out. But I do really like Julian Arosa here. I like Alex Caceres. I'm going to be sad when he loses this fight. But Julian Arosa is my guy. He's going to put the pace on him. He's going to win this fight. I don't know whether it's going to be a decision, submission, or a knockout. But Julian Arosa is getting this one done. Let's see you in the next we got video. a super interesting flyweight matchup between Alessandro Costa taking on Amir Albazi. Amir Albazi, 4-1 in his last five fights, 5-0 for Costa. Costa is taking this fight on short notice, though. Albazi's had a few opponents drop out, and Costa wants to make that debut into the UFC, which is what he's going to do here. So he's got a tough night out against Albazi doing that on short notice. So in this matchup, though, for Costa, he's very dangerous. He does have a high level of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that he can, he can go to. Particularly, his arm bars are deadly. I didn't specify that up there, but his arm bars are deadly. The guy's got quite a few of them, and he even has a flying arm bar early in his career. Um, I did not see that one when I was watching the tape study, so I missed the flying arm bar. Saw it on the on the record. I've seen quite a few arm bars though, so there's that. He does have have some Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu skill, a lot of it. Good grappling to go along with it. Um, he mixes he mixes that in with that power in the hands. His last fight, he knocked the guy out in what 12 seconds or something like that. Crushed him. But the problem is, 
And we kind of saw it on his uh, Contender Series fight that he could be a little bit low volume. So even though he won on the Contender Series, he didn't end up, I believe, I don't remember if it was a split decision or an animus decision. I can't remember off the top of my head. But either way, he ended up being kind of a lower volume fighter. And uh, it just wasn't super exciting. And it ended up get, didn't end up getting him into the UFC. So now he's got to take this fight on short notice to get into the UFC. And honestly, I think it's a really hard matchup for him. Because across from him, although he is a great grappler, uh, or a very, you know, he's he's got the skills. Albazi, that grappling is very, very high level. He's super, he's a great grappler. He is super skilled on the mat. Transitions are smooth as butter. His, uh, he's always got the submission threat there. Every time when he's transitioning, there's a threat of, of a submission or a, a move up in position. He can advance the position or threaten you with the submission at the same time and then take what you give him. He's very slick with that. Um, something else, he's very good at timing the takedowns as well. Abazi's not just shooting takedowns from across the cage, not not looking for the openings. He's timing these under your your punches. He's timing these by setting them up with, with, a, with a strike or two of his own. He's, he's working these in well, and he does have decent boxing to go along with it. And I think a lot of it is because the threat of that takedown does help open up that boxing. So for me, Amir Albazi is probably the better all-around fighter, but he can get hit. Uh, we've seen him get hit quite a few times. He more or less, he's been able to, to weather the storm. I mean, the guy's 15-1 for a reason. I think Albazi should get this done, but the odds are crazy. Something I really like here, the under 2.5. And, and why do I say that? Albazi, if he wins, he's probably going to be able to finish Costa because he's a he's a monster. So Albazi is going to be able to fin get the finish here. Yes, it could go to decision. I don't think so. I don't think it does. I think Albazi, if he wins, he gets the, the finish. However... Account for the armbar from Costa. Account from the knockout punch from Costa. Because the dude hits really hard, and the dude's got a slick armbar. So you account for that by saying, I, I'm going to go under two and a half. The last two, two minutes and 30 seconds, we just hope nothing happens there. But, uh, but I'm going to go under two and a half in this one. I do like that. Not a big play for me, but I like it. So I'm going to play the under two and a half in this one. I think Albazi gets the win for the pick. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I'd love to hear your opinion, as I've mentioned a couple of times already. But uh, let's get to the next fight. We've got a couple of really big ones coming up. That main event should be really fun. And I've got some good, interesting takes on that one next for you. Next up, we have Demir Ismagulov taking on Armin Sarukian in our co-main event of the evening in the lightweight division. In this matchup, in the last five fights, both guys should be 5-0. and oh, But Armin Sarukian is 4-1 after I thought he beat Gamrot, but they gave the fight to Gamrot. I thought Sarukian won that fight, but either way, both guys should be 5-0. and oh. There's an argument on the Ismagulov side that he should be 4-1 and one after his last fight, but either way, you got 5-0 and oh versus 4-1. and one. That's what the record says. That's what they're going to be called. In this matchup, we've got a, uh, a bit of a height and reach advantage on the Ismagulov side. He's 5'10", as opposed to the 5'7", for the Sarukian side. He has a 74-inch reach, as opposed to the 72 and a half on the Sarukian side. Now, that's going to play a big advantage for Ismagulov here. Because his best path to victory, because if you look at these, a lot of their skills are very similar. His best path to victory is to be able to strike at range with Armin Sarukian. So for Ismagulov, if you can keep it at range, I do think he has the better striking at that distance. And with the height and reach advantage, that's going to be important. Because both guys do have strong wrestling and strong ground and pound. Both guys are solid there. I would give the lean to Sarukian in that, but both guys are very solid. Both guys have really good takedown defense. Uh, I don't know who I'd give the lean to on that one, but both guys are very good in the takedown defense. But the range striking, definitely for Ismagulov. Once that striking breaks range and gets in tight, you get the, you get that unorthodox style of Sarukian with like the spinning back fist and all that, that kind of nastier style of striking. That then favors Sarukian. In this matchup, I think that if, if Ismagulov keeps it on the feet and is able to work that striking, he will be able to get his, himself a victory here. But for me... I'm going to pick Armin Sarukian. Reason why. I think he gets this fight to the mat at least once. And I do think he can do a lot with it once he does. I do think Sarukian is going to be able to get this fight to the to the mat more than maybe more than one time, but at least once. And when like, like I said, when he does, I think he's going to be able to deal some damage. And it'll be enough that on the feet, it'll be close enough after that or even before that that he can win enough to either A, win on a decision, or B, Get the fight out of there, or get the, get it over before it gets too late in the fight. I do think Ismagulov is a very talented fighter. I think this this almost sucks. These two are fighting each other right here because I typically would pick both of them to win in their fights. But I'm gonna lean Sarukian. 
I got robbed on the decision with him last time. At least I felt like it wasn't a robbery, but I was I I thought he won. I picked him last time against Gamrot. Thought he did well enough to get the win. I think Gamrot's a tough matchup for his Magulov as well. But I'm going to take Sarukian because I think he beat Gamrot. And I think that that, uh, that style that he has is going to be enough just to get the edge here. It's a close fight. I'm not confident enough to say that I would, I would put anything on this or if I do, not very much. But for me, Sarukian is the pick. Let me know what you guys got. Our main event's coming up, and I cannot wait Here to break it. Is the main it. event of the evening. But before we get into that, if you've made it this far in the video and you're enjoying yourself, please do me a favor and like this video. Also, if you've enjoyed this channel, it might do you some benefit to subscribe to this channel so you can find my videos as they come out right there at the side of your page or up at the top of your page, depending on what device you're looking at this on. But subscribe to the channel for your own benefit. I would appreciate it, but it's more for your own benefit as well because guess what? It makes it real easy for you. And if I get enough subscribers, I can keep making videos. So there we go. In the main event, let's talk about that. We have a couple of guys at 185 pounds who are trying to come back after a, after a loss. Both guys losing to either the champion or the former champion. Strickland getting knocked out by Pereira and uh, Cannoneer losing to Israel Adesanya in a very clear-cut decision. Some people are like, oh yeah, Cannoneer won one round. Yeah, whatever. He clearly, it was not close. It wasn't a close fight. Uh, anyway, both guys coming off of losses that weren't the best losses. They didn't look good. But this is going to be a good, good chance for one of them to start working their way back up towards the title, or at least title contention. The other guy going to have to kind of stay around where they're at for a little while. So in this one here, uh, we have Sean Strickland, who 4-1 and one in his last fight. He was doing great up until that Pereira loss. 25 and 4 on the career. That's a darn good record. You look at Cannonier's side. Now he's he's spanning this over three weight classes, two weight classes for Strickland, but three weight classes, 15 and 6 on the career, 3 and 2 in the last five. So a little less on the last five, but he's he's looked pretty good lately. A couple of hiccups here and there. Uh, something I want to point out though. People are fading Strickland hard here because they're they, because they got knocked out by Alex Pereira. The dude's the friggin' champion of the world. He went to kickbox. He went to try to kickbox a, a world champion kickboxer who is now the MMA middleweight champion of the world in the UFC. You think I have a little bit of a break on that one? It happens. It was a horrible game plan. Don't get me wrong, but I see why. It, I don't know. It do, you can't just throw out everything he's done before that because of that loss. At least that's where I'm at. Uh, for Sean Strickland, people are looking past how he did, looked against Uriah Hall, who's you know, was at the end of his career. The Brennan Allen win, Christoph Jotko, um, any all the all the others. The Hermanson fight was weird, but it was. I don't know why that ended up as a split decision. If anybody watched that fight, there's no way that should have been a split decision. Strickland clearly beat Hermanson. I thought it was obvious, but whatever. I'm not a judge. Judging sucks. They're all terrible. Um, anyway, for Strickland, people were talking smack about his boxing, but realistically, he's got good boxing. The guy. It's not crisp. It's not like a Bobby Green. We're going to talk about Bobby Green again real quick. Bobby Green's got very pretty boxing. It, it's legit. Now, for Sean Strickland, his boxing works for MMA because he's walking guys down, patting your shots away, and just peppering you with his one-twos or whatever. And if he can get you starting to turtle up against the cage, he'll start throwing these big uppercuts. That's what Sean Strickland does. And it works for him, and it's worked for him very well. He's 25-4 and four on his career. People are fading this guy hard, to, saying that he's... You know, he's crap. He has never been any good. What are you talking about? The guy's 25 and 4 on his career and has only lost in his last five. His only loss since he came back from the motorcycle wreck is to Alex Perez, who's the current champion of the world. So, anyway, the boxing does well. He's got a high volume. He walks forward and puts a pace on you, and he makes it very hard for you to take any ground back from him. He does not back up. The, there's a couple problems with that, though. It does leave him susceptible to things like the leg kick, to be also hit as he's coming in, which. It's not going to feel very good. Um, it's what happened to him against Perez. So there's that. He does have good wrestling in his back pocket, though he never freaking uses it. And if he used it, maybe he'd have some more success. But he does have good wrestling. When he made it into the UFC, a lot of his earlier fights, he was winning with that wrestling at the welterweight division back then when he came into the UFC. Um, but he does have great cardio, and he's an excellent minute winner. I will say almost for certain that if this fight goes to decision, you're going to say Strickland's getting his hand raised over five rounds in a decision. But this fight may not go to decision. So we're going to look at the Cannoneer side here. For Cannoneer, I also didn't mention the age. He's only 31, whereas Cannoneer's 38. So we're going to put that out there. 
I don't think that's a big issue. Cannoneers look does, hasn't even really shown signs of age yet. It is a heavier weight division. I mean, 185, not the heaviest, but whatever. Uh, I don't think that's going to be a big issue, but I'm pointing it out anyway, so nobody thinks I overlooked it. In this one, Cannoneer, his striking isn't, I wouldn't say as uh, technically sound as some, but it's very effective. Why is that? Because he's got a lot of power, and he can mix in the leg kicks, which is something that Sean Strickland is susceptible to. Uh, so Jared Cannoneer does have wicked power, and obviously we found out that Strickland's susceptible to that as well. Uh, but he, but he's kind of lower volume. So for Cannoneer, a lot of times he can get caught waiting for a shot or looking for it. And I don't know if it's just me, but sometimes he kind of loads up on those shots. Not every time. Sometimes he can just let it fly. But a lot. But if he's trying to seek the knockout, which I could see rounds three, four, or five, towards the end of this fight, he might be starting to seek a knockout if he's not clearly ahead on the scorecards. And and for Cannoneer, if you start to seek a knockout, you're going to see those punches come. If he's starting to like load up on all his shots... Strickland's going to see him come in and be able to, do, to outwork that. But earlier in the fight, Cannonier's got a good shot of putting Strickland out. He was just put out in his last fight. No, he wasn't totally slept, but he was put out in his last fight. I will say, Cannonier's best pack to victory here is the knockout. So there's a way to play this fight. Yeah, you can just pick whoever you think is going to win and, and play that. And if we're going just that route, I'm going to pick Strickland because he's a better minute winner, and I'm not going to count on a guy that's packed to victory as a knockout. But... The way to play it, I'm gonna play. I would. I'm gonna say play Sean Strickland, play a money line. I know you guys are already getting ready to type the comments. You're you're already saying, oh no, Cannonier's gonna win this fight. Maybe he does, and I'm gonna account for that. Cannonier by knockout. If I Cannonier, I think is already the underdog by knockout. Even better, I don't think he wins a five round decision against a guy like Sean Strickland, who is just going to walk forward, use his cardio, use the pace. I just don't see a guy with this much volume losing a decision to a guy with this much volume. So I'm taking Sean Strickland if it goes to decision. But by knockout, there's Jared Cannon here. Play the money line on Strickland because, yes, he can also get the knockout. It's it's a potential thing that he can do. He has done it in a few fights. He did get the TKO over Brendan Allen. There is that. Cannon here, though, knockout's his best path to victory. Anybody that thinks otherwise, like, give me, tell me what you're thinking. What do you think? How are you thinking he gets it done by decision? Are you thinking he submits Sean Strickland? I don't see that either. It's the knockout. We all know it. So play him by knockout. Hedge your bet, but you can use it to cover the bet at least because you're going to get pretty decent odds on Cannonier by knockout. So that's how you play this fight by my understanding. That's the way I've got it look, looking at. Uh, I'm going to play Cannonier, knockout, Strickland, money line. That's the way to play it. Let me know what you guys think. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come and watch this video. Taking the time to spend this, this the rest of this year, the end of this year, with me on my channel here. I've only been doing this thing for about four months now. And all of you guys have been awesome. I've got some guys in the comments that are there every week. Um, I want to shout you guys out, but I don't want to forget anybody. And I'll feel like a dick if I do. But something I'll, man I'll mention, I'm going to be doing some videos every, at least weekly during this time away from the fights. And whoever can give me the coolest or best, my favorite comment in this one, it, uh, at the, in the comments of this fight, for whatever reason, I'm going to go ahead and shout you, particularly you, out in the next video that I do. And in doing that, I'm also going to kind of, you know, give you, give you the little, give you the rub, the old popularity, you know, say, hey, so and so, their comment was this. I'm going to read it out on the camera, or whatever. And uh, yeah, you'll get that. I don't know if anybody cares to do that, but whatever. If you want it, it's there. Um, thanks guys for sticking around. Thanks for being part of the channel for this year. We have more fights coming next year, or at least for the UFC, but I'm going to have, I'm going to have some videos coming out this, this, during this break. So don't worry, stay tuned to the channel. Check out the video that's probably already popping up on the end screen list. That's my favorite, favorite, favorite fighters. I've got that one because, well, it's the only one that's really, really uh, relevant after a week. So whatever. See you guys probably next year, or I guess next week, but next year for the fights. Looking forward to it. I appreciate all of you. Like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you think that'd be a good thing. Let's do this.